diseases of the spinal cord. I welcome on behalf of the Department of Neurosurgery, Dhaka Medical College, to these two versatile personalities and our learned participants. So I should also thank Bangladesh Society of Radiology and Imaging, Society of Neurologists of Bangladesh, and Bangladesh Society of Neurosurgeons of Bangladesh. So with these few words, I would uh, advise the convener to go on with the session. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. So uh, I think we shouldn't waste time. We, uh, for our keynote speaker, Professor George Rodesh, he will be starting his session. And I'd like to request Professor J. D. S. Choudhury for a brief introduction of Professor George Rodesh. Professor sir, please. Uh, good day. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce Professor George Odesh. Uh, he's a good friend of mine and I know him since 80s when we both worked at the world-renowned Bicetre Hospital in Paris. George was trained under Professor Pierre Lagenius, the father of current-day interventional neuroradiology. George Odesh is originally from Luxembourg. And he graduated from University of Louis Pasteur in Strasbourg, France. He specialized in radiology and medical imaging from University Libre de Bruxelles in Belgium at Erasmus University Hospital. He did his fellowship in neuroradiology under the mentorship of Professor Pierre Lagenius in Paris and is a very long time first assistant of Pierre Lagenius. He served as a faculty for a long time at University of Paris in different, different capacities. Currently, he is the chairman of radiology and interventional therapeutic neuroradiology at Hospital Foch, affiliated with the University of Versailles Saint Quentin on Evelyn in Paris. He is a consultant of interventional neuroradiology at Erasmus Hospital and Hôpital et de la Citadelle in Liège, Belgium, Karolinska Hospital, Stockholm, Sweden, and British National Hospital of Neurology and Neurosurgery, Queen Square, London. He is a visiting professor of Royal College of Medicine and Surgery of Canada, University of Manitoba at Winnipeg, and University of Laval in Quebec. He is also a member of the scientific committee of European courses of neuroradiology and planet course in neurovascular pathology. He is sitting in the editorial board for more than half a dozen peer reviewed journals, including EPTA Neurosurgica, Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Psychiatry, Neuroread. Journal of Interventional Neuroradiology and Journal of Neuroradiology. He is a senior member and past president of World Federation of International and Therapeutic Neuroradiology and co chair of the second World Brain AVM meeting held in Nancy, France. He is a co author of 35 multi authored textbooks and author of about 350 original publications in peer reviewed journals. The Department of Neuroradiology under its chairmanship at Foch Hospital is a European reference center for rare diseases of spinal cord and arteriovenous malformation. He is the recipient of knighthood of Chevalier de la Région d'Honneur, the highest national award from the French government in 2017 for his outstanding scientific contribution. This highly prestigious award of merit was established by Napoleon Bonaparte from the year 1802 Today, we are all proud to be here to listen to his very important presentation. So please welcome Professor George Odesh. George Odesh, please. Thank you very much for this uh, very, very kind introduction. And it's for me a uh, tremendous honor to be part of this uh, session. And uh, I will do my best to share with you uh, what we have learned for since many years concerning diagnosis and management of uh, spinal cord arteriovenous malformations. Uh, do you see the slide properly? Yes, it's okay. Is it okay for everyone? No. 
sir, uh, it's not uh, visible sir, right now. Okay, I'll do that. Can I move on? Just sir, on. we cannot see your slides, sir. Just hold on, doctor. Let me know. I think you are spilling my things here. So, is anything not functioning? Just hold uh, just hold no, sir, sir, uh, you have to share your screen, sir. That's what I did. We uh, did a picture, but uh, I can see George's picture, but I don't know what happened. Why is this? So hold on a second again. Then I, that's what exactly what I did previously. Wait, this, that. You see my slides or not? No, sir. Ah, yeah, no, yeah. sir. Hold a second. I do it again then. Here. Is this better to reconnect? Yes, I do that. Get started. You could see your skin. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's okay now? Okay, okay. sir. Right now, sir. See the slide moving? You see the second slide or not? Yeah, it's, uh, we can see the slides. Okay, good. Shall we do it? So, uh, when we speak about spinal cord at your venous shunts, um, there is, of course, some preliminary work to do uh, before just embolizing the lesion. So what do we need? We need proper MR studies in axial, sagittal, coronal views. And we also do nowadays a lot of angio MRs that help us to uh, see properly the vascular malformation and predict a little bit about the uh, angiography that will have to be performed secondarily. We also need then a proper angiogram, not only in 2Ds, but also in 3D views. And we nowadays do more and more often these expert CT or cone beam CT angiographies that show very precisely the relationship between the cord vasculature and the vascular malformation itself. And you see very well how in certain circumstances the venous congestion is responsible for the compression of the cord and secondarily also, of course, uh, responsible for the uh, uh, clinical symptoms that the patient will. Can you, sir, for a second, can you enable full screen, please, sir? In a, please enable full screen. Anything wrong? We can you enable please full screen? Slide, mode, slide view. Can you please go to slide view? I have slide view. But they cannot see in the full screen. I don't know. Ah, wait. So what happens then? For me, it's it. I, I for me, it is full view. I stop yeah. again. I share my sl my slide. I do it here. I share. Do you see now full screen or not? Yeah, yeah full screen. Yeah, it's okay now. Okay, sir. Is oh. everyone? Okay? No, okay, sir. Okay, good then, sorry. So as I said, preliminary work with MR and preliminary work with angiograms, 2Ds, 3Ds, expert CTs. As far as technique is concerned, uh, we do use always microcatheters as magic 1.2 FMs, which are very small and separated distality. Most of the time, we use glue to embolize the spinal cord lesions. In some circumstances, we do use a coil, but it's very rare. I will show you some examples where we use the coils. And we try to analyze the spinal cord lesions according to three data, which is anatomy, which is architecture, and the clinical symptoms of the patients. We're going back to that in a moment. Um, Dr. Shuduri asked me to bring you some reminders concerning the spinal cord vascular anatomy. And we're going very fast through these important data. 
And to understand this vascular anatomy, we have to go back to embryology and understand that about day 40 of the embryological life, uh, the neural tube will be surrounded on both sides by somites. You see them very well here on this uh, electronic microscopic view, the neural tube and bilaterally the somites. Again here on this other view, superiorly located the neural tube and the somites on both sides. These somites correspond to segmental mesoderm tissue. Uh, they will give rise secondarily to the vertebral column, the muscles, the connective tissues, and the skin. Interesting is to note that each of these somites will receive one pair of arteries arising from the dorsal aorta, which will be called the segmental artery. These segmental arteries are 31 pairs. The 31 pairs of segmental arteries will be split into eight cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and one coccygean. And they will take in charge the bone and the muscles and the nervous structures in the metameric disposition. And it is this metameric organization because they are these arteries takes in charge the structures on the same metamere that will finally bring the proper vascularization of the cord, as we will see later. So you will see then also diseases that will be located on the same metamere, the so-called Cobb syndrome or spinal arteriovenous metameric syndromes, as you see here in this child, or as you see here in this patient, where you have skin, you have muscles, you have bone, and you have on the same metamere, you also have spinal cord vascular distribution of the disease. To understand again, or to play with this metamerization, you can definitely look properly at the angiograms. So look here at this case. The catheter is in L1 on the right side. The radiculomedullary artery reaches the cord and gives rise, at, gives rise to a vascular malformation located at this myelomere. The L1 right side corresponds also to vascular malformation at the spinous process from L1 to L1. So there is already here some kind of metameric distribution. And if you look a little bit more closely, you see very well that there is another vascular malformation located more distally, more caudally on the spinal cord, but separated from the upper one by, the, by a free interval of normal cord tissue. So if this is L1, this is L2, this will be then L3. And if we have a metameric disposition between L1 and L1, could we have a metaradic disposition between L3? Where is the dermatome of L3? It's at the level of the tight. And indeed, in this patient, you see very well that the lesion was also associated to, an upper, to a lower limb vascular malformation at the tight. So you see how we can play finally with this distribution. These segmental arteries also vascularize the developing peripheral nervous system and the developing nerve root. As a corollary to that, you have to understand and remember that an artery to the cord always follows a nerve root. There is a difference of development between the spine and the spinal cord, which will then create the obliquity of the nerve roots. And then, of course, also of the radicular arteries. And because there is a discrepancy between the difference of growth between the cervical level and the low, lower lumbar level, you see very well that the obliquity of the arteries going to the cord will finally be more and more pronounced the more cranial, caudally you go. In the upper cervical region, you have a nearly horizontal traject. The lower you go in the lumbar area, you will see the more hairpin aspect and the more oblique position of the artery itself. The arteries, uh, if you ask yourself if an artery of an angiogram is finally related to the cord or not, just remember the rule that the artery follows the root before reaching then the midline, if it, you consider the anterior spinal artery, for example. So if you look at this artery here and you think or you believe or you suspect that this artery is located on the spinal cord, 
look where the origin of the artery is. And you see very well that the artery does not follow an ascending traject like the root before going down and reaching the midline. It's a more horizontal traject in this lower uh, cord uh, segment. So this cannot correspond to an artery going to the cord, but correspond to a spinous process artery going to the bone. So if you have a lesion vascularized at that level, you can very well embolize it safely without risking of damaging the cord just by playing with anatomy. The neural tube itself uh, will be vascularized um, during the embryological development at the force between the fourth and the sixth week of the intrauterine life, this neural tube will be vascularized by two longitudinal ventral arteries that develop at the anterior surface of the future spinal cord. The posterior aspect of the cord will be surrounded by a dense capillary network and that capillary network is located around the neural tube, but you will have secondarily creation, development, or individualization of two longitudinal axes at the posterior surface of the cord. The ventral arteries will develop at the anterior surface of the ventral cord and are therefore created embryologically, and they are anatomically induced, while the capillary network uh, that will force the two longitudinal axes to individualize will be more flow-induced in these circumstances. The two anterior longitudinal axes of the neural tube will finally migrate towards the midline and fuse over the whole length to form a longitudinal ventral axis, which is the anterior spinal artery. This anterior spinal artery projects on the AP views on the midline. It arises, and we will see that in a moment, from the vertebral basilar junction, will be uh, fed by several other radiculomedary contributors till it reaches the end of the cord at the level of the basket. You might have embryological non-fusions or misfusions, and this corresponds then to a duplicated or fenestrated anterior spinal artery. If this non-fusion occurs over a long segment, you will have this kind of rail bilateral aspect parallel of the two vessels. And you see it very well also here from this anatomical picture from Philippe Mercier. If the non-fusion is very short and very limited to a small segment, you will have this kind of diamond shape aspect that you will see here. The arterial supply of each vascular network is initially brought by these segmental arteries at each level. But we know very well that during embryological life, you will have a phenomena that is called summation or desegmentation that corresponds to the regression of some of these radicular contribution to the spinal cord network, will then remain in the adult distribution only about four to eight anterior arteries and about 10 to 20 posterior arteries that will persist. The problem is if you want to rebuild the vasculature of the spinal cord, you do not know exactly where they arise from and you will be then forced to go on each level to try to find the level where the artery rises and how to rebuild the contribution to the spinal cord. The remnants of these segmental arteries will take in charge the nerves, the bones, and the dura itself. Taken in consideration that initially you have two longitudinal ventral arteries that will finally fuse. Before that fusion, sulcal arteries appear at the dorsal aspect of each of these paired ventral, uh, ventral arteries. 
And when this fusion has occurred, the sulcal arteries will also remain lateralized. You have some very rare cases of proximal fusion, uh, but uh, with a common trunk, but usually you really have these two uh, uh, sulcal arteries absolutely individualized and separated one from another. The peel network develops secondarily and vascularizes the uh, spinal cord funiculi by perforating arteries. You see very well, thanks to the expert CT or, or uh, cone beam CT views that we can achieve now, obtain nowadays, you see how they correspond very precisely to the anatomical picture, as you can see in Pierre Lajonias's or Armin Tron's books. So you can individualize, if you, even if you forget here the spinal cord vascular malformation, you have the sulcal arteries that remain lateralized and the ventral sulcus that may anastomose one with another in the depths of the sulcus, and you have posterior spinal uh, artery perforating that goes inside of the funiculi of the white matter posteriorly or laterally. Taking in charge then, or taking in consideration this vasculature, you obtain the so-called definitive vascularization of the spinal cord, which will then be created by both extrinsic vessels and intrinsic vessels. Let's go through the extrinsic vascularization of the cord, which means the vessels that are located outside the cord itself. And you will have, of course, radicular arteries. The radicular arteries which represent the slightest, the minimal contribution of the segmental system. You will remember that the artery always follows a nerve root and its trajectory can stop at the level of the nerve root and vascularize exclusively the nerve root without reaching the cord. Or you have radiculopeal arteries that can be either anterior or posterior and they will participate to the constitution of the peel network, which is this dense peel network that surrounds the cord like a sleeve. Or you have radiculomedullary arteries, which are those that reach the midline, correspond to the vascular supply of the anterior spinal artery, and by its division into a superior cranial and an inferior caudal branch, because of the anastomosis between all these arteries on the midline, you will create the continuity of the anterior spinal artery. If you have an extrinsic circulation or vascularization, you also have an intrinsic vascularization. And this is important because these vessels that you might not see initially during a proper angiogram are those vessels that in the majority of cases will take in charge the vascular malformation. And you will then describe in this intrinsic vasculature, sulcal arteries, perforating arteries, and anastomosis between the anterior sulcal and the posterior perforating artery, as you can see here in Armin Tron's pictures, or in Pierre Lajonias's drawing, or in this case of expert CT between the sulcal artery, the peel network, the transmedullary intrinsic anastomosis. And we will see how this can be of importance also when you want to treat in the spinal cord at your venous malformation. Both extrinsic and intrinsic vasculature have longitudinal and axial dispositions. The longitudinal extrinsic, once again, covers the posterior aspect of the cord via the lateral spinal artery that takes in charge the posterior aspect of the cervical cord. This lateral spinal artery might arise either directly from the vertebral artery or from the pica, depending on the origin of the pica itself. It participates to the collateralization of this peel network between one side and the other. This extrinsic longitudinal 
aspect will be fed on different segments, 10 to 20, as I told you, by radicular PL arteries that will participate to the continuity of the artery till you reach the basket. And the basket corresponds to the division at the level of the conus medullaris between the anterior spinal artery and both posterior spinal arteries. Below the basket, there is no spinal cord tissue anymore. The vessel that you see here that goes down, that is in the continuity of the anterior spinal artery, is the artery of the filum terminale. And the anterior aspect, uh, you also have a longitudinal extrinsic outside the cord, which corresponds to the anterior spinal artery. The anterior spinal artery, anastomosis again, with the posterior spinal arteries also being part of longitudinal extrinsic accesses, and will also here participate to the linealization of the end of the conus medullaris. Once again, magnified view, anterior spinal artery, posterior spinal artery, right, posterior spinal artery, left, continuity of the anterior spinal artery, below the basket is the artery of the filum terminale. If you have an extrinsic longitudinal from cranial to caudal, you will have also an extrinsic axial. And the extrinsic axial is the dorsal, uh, dorsal lateral and ventral plexus that turn around the cord and participate to this PL network that surrounds the cord like a sleeve. If you have extrinsic, you also have intrinsic. Intrinsic longitudinal are those radiculomedullary artery that give rise to multiple uh, uh, vascularization of multiple segments through the sulcal arteries. The sulcal artery is also anastomose on the midline, one with another, intrasulcal anastomosis. You see here on this expert CT again, intrasulcal anastomosis in the depths of the sulcus. And you might have intrafunicular anastomosis also. And then you have this intrinsic axial anastomosis corresponding to the intramedullary or transmedullary anastomosis or transfunicular anastomosis from one segment to the other. Spinal cord veins, if you have, if you follow exactly the same distribution between extrinsic and intrinsic, you can have or speak about the same kind of words concerning the veins. You have intrinsic veins. The intrinsic veins correspond to this very dense network inside of the cord itself. There will be axial anastomosis, longitudinal anastomosis, and very important transmedullary veins that may communicate the anterior with the posterior spinal cord veins. These are absolutely normal features. They can be very large. They can have about one millimeter thickness. They are absolutely normal channels. Here you see from Armin Tron again, one of these transmedullary uh, veins. These intrinsic veins will finally be collected by the peel venous network. The peel venous network is at the surface of the cord. Will finally regroup all the intrinsic veins. These peel veins um, at the surface are in different anatomical spaces if they are anterior or if they are posterior. The posterior spinal vein is, the anti, I'm sorry, the anterior spinal vein is located in the depths of the ventral sulcus. It is below the artery and it is covered by a thick layer of pia mater, which is the linear splendens. <laughs> 
while the posterior spinal veins are not in the superior space. They are floating in a subarachnoid space. And this is where they can dilate much more than the anterior spinal vein. And if you have a dural fistula that is draining into these posterior spinal cord veins, these spinal cord veins will dilate rather uh, uh, nicely, and you will see them then nicely on the MR uh, with these tortuosities, flow void tortuosities. Here you see from this anatomical picture from Philippe Mercier, how nicely that the anterior spinal vein is located below the anterior spinal axis in the depths of the ventral sulcus, while the posterior spinal veins are located in the subarachnoid space. The longitudinal venous network, both ventral and dorsal, has no dominance. Both dorsal and ventral veins can drain the gray matter. Usually you have one median collector in the cervical area or in the lumbar area and up to three collectors in the thoracic area. It might create, of course, if this is engorged because of hyperpressure, a natural obstacle in these circumstances. There is a bipolarity of the thoracic drainage. It can go either cranially or caudally. And finally, this extrinsic vein reach either radicular veins or emissary veins to pierce the dura and reach the epidural plexuses. So the arteries always follow the nerve root. The vein might not follow the nerve root and be located between two different nerve roots, corresponding then to an emissary vein. This is perhaps boring at first sight to imagine or to remember this anatomy. But if we want to speak about embolization of vascular malformation of the cord, we have to consider this vascular anatomy because the catheter will be brought into each of these different vessels. And the prognosis of your, or the risks induced in your procedure will finally depend on the super selective catheterization that you should be able to perform. But now if you look at spinal cord veins, how do we recognize or classify them? And if you ask yourself the question, what is the interest of a classification? Well, the classification is needed to put lesions in boxes for easy comprehension, in order to speak a common language to recognize properly and objectively the various diseases that are concerned. The problem is that in the literature, very often you have discrepancies between the different classifications. And I will not go into the details of all the classification that you can find in the literature. I will just try to share with you the way we look at these vascular things, at these vascular disposition. And this is based on anatomic recognition. So grossly speaking, you have four types of what can be called spinal cord RTU venous shunts, according to the relationship with the spine or with the dura. So you can have paraspinal RTU venous shunt that will have an influence on the cord itself. And these are located outside the spine. You can have extradural or epidural shunts, and they will be located in the epidural space between the bone and the external surface of the dura. <coughs> I'm sorry. You can have the classical dural shunts, which are inside of the depth of the dura itself, and you can have intradural atio venous shunts that will be located on the other side of the dura and will affect all the neurological components that will be located in this anatomical space, either the cord, the roots, or perhaps the filum terminale. We will exclusively from now on speak about the spinal cord atio venous shunts and we will detail the 216, or speak about the 216 lesions that we have been lucky enough to see uh, uh, in our practice here in Hôpital Foch. <clears throat> 
some views to explain how they can act finally on the court, each of these lesions. Even if you have a paraspinal lesion outside the court, the veins that drain this paraspinal lesion can finally compress the cord by penetrating inside of the canal and shifting the cord laterally. I'm sorry, this is too rapid. Okay. They can eventually compress the cord or they can eventually drain towards the cord and create some venous myelopathy, as epidural shunts will also create. An epidural shunt is recognized because the primary venous drainage is located inside of the epidural uh, plexuses, as you see here. The primary fistula, the fistula drains primarily into this epidural dilated plexus. Why is this patient suffering of neurological symptoms? Because of thrombosis proximal and distally, there is a hyperpressure inside of the system that finally refluxes into spinal cord veins and creates the venous myelopathy. The dual chance you know, it creates this hypersignal into cord corresponding also here to the venous myelopathy. You see very well the tortuosities of the spinal cord veins, anterior and posterior. The shunt is located in the depths of the dura, drains into a radicular or an emissary vein before reaching the spinal cord veins and creating the problem. And the intradural lesion can then be located either on the nerve root, on the filum terminale, or on the spinal cord itself. But now that you have recognized the anatomical space where the lesion is located, and if we speak now again exclusively from now on about the intradural cord shunts, the gross architecture helps you to recognize the morphology of the shunt. And these lesions have to be split easily into two types, either fistula or nidus. Fistulae are always superficial. And there exist two types of fistulae. Those what they have named micro arteriovenous fistulae, corresponding to a small size lesion fed by one or multiple radicular PL arteries or radicular medullary arteries of different calibers, slightly enlarged, and finally congestioning spinal cord veins. But the shunt is very small. As opposed to these micro shunts, you have macro shunts. And these macro shunts are large feeders that always end primarily into a ginous, giant venous ectasia. The primary drainage is the giant venous ectasia before it drains secondarily into other spinal cord veins. This is very often seen in the pediatric population, and this is highly related to either HHT disease or another genetical disease, which is RASA1 mutation. So this means if you see one of these lesions, you have to think about the underlying genetical disorder, and we will see in a moment also why. Niduses. Niduses can be of different localization inside of the cord or outside of the cord. And I'm happy to share with you the latest paper that we just uh, had accepted last week in the Journal of Neurosurgery. We had a wonderful Japanese fellow, Katsuhiro Mitsutani, who finally agreed to uh, uh, review all the 210 patients that we had at that time uh, and analyzed with us the vascular types of these lesions. And we were then able to split the niduses into different groups. You have intramedullary niduses, those that are located inside of the cord itself, vascularized by anterior and posterior spinal arteries that give rise to these perforating arteries, sulcal arteries, and takes in charge the nidus. But you might also have niduses that, that, that are extramedullary, outside of the cord, outside of the cord, but that may penetrate partially inside of the cord, either because of the veins that bulge inside of the cord itself, or because of a small intrafunicular extension. 
So you see, you also have a group of lesion that is located inside of the sulcus. So you can split finally, and this is the drawing that Katsuhiro made to make us understand a little bit better, clearer on this drawing. This is here the anatomy, the normal anatomy of the cord. You can have macro fistulae that located posteriorly, giant venous ectasia, that can be located posteriorly or anteriorly. You can have lesions located in the sulcus. You can have lesions of microfistula located at the posterior spinal aspect that can be vascularized by PL feeders or eventually by transmedary feeders that vascularize also the shunt. And as far as nidoses is concerned, you can have intramedary nidoses that will always be fed by perforating arteries from the posterior spinal and from the anterior spinal artery. Those affect the gray matter and the white matter. And you can have nidoses exclusively located at the surface of the cord without invading the cord. Some nidoses might penetrate partially inside of the funiculi, or some nidoses might remain extra funicular but penetrate inside of the cord because of they, they use partially the spinal cord veins to drain secondarily inside of the cord itself. And to show you another example how these veins can mimic finally uh, important nidoses, look at this young boy who was referred to us initially as having a large, diffuse, compact nidus type lesion. First sight, indeed, it looks like that a nidus spread over several levels. However, if you embolize, and we discovered that secondarily, we embolized one shot of glue here in this fistula, another shot of glue in that fistula, and this is the result. So you could see very well that these fistulae located at the surface of the cord congestionate over several myelomeres these intrinsic veins, giving them rise to these pseudo nidus. And after resolution of the fistula, you see that everything shrinks, all these veins shrink, and the patient goes back to an improved neurological status. If you consider then also the spinal cord lesions, they can be single, they can be multiple, on several myelomeres, and you will speak then of multiple, multi, myelomeric dispositions, but you can also have multiple lesions on the same myelomere. Look at here, this young girl, anterior spinal artery, unfused. One goes into a macrofistula, one goes into a macrofistula on the same myelomere. Posteriorly, you have an artery, you have an artery that reaches one and two different vessels different veins. So this child had at the same myelomere four different spinal cord lesions. And then you can have this metameric disposition, either horizontal or vertical, horizontal according to the localization of the vascular malformation or associated to limb vascular malformation as here in this clipper uh, trenone or better called Clove syndrome nowadays. So this is the way we try to look at the lesions. First, the anatomical space in which it is located. Second, the morphology of the shunt. Third, the localization of the shunt, if you speak about nidus, intramedullary, extramedullary, and it is the vascular disposition, the architectonics that gives rise and helps you to understand definitely this type of classification. You should not forget also that these uh, uh, vascular malformations are living structures. They are living structures and they might evolve over time by angiogenesis. Look at this case here, how compact it was initially, how it has become later on. Or this lesion here, how it has become later on, over time. And this angiogenesis can 
have different aspects. Usually it is a venous congestion, the venous hypoxia, that creates release of the uh, angiogenetic factor. Or you can have angioectasia just by dilatation of vessels around the cord, or eventually angiogenesis on the clot. Let me show you one example. Look at this young boy. 2000, hematomyelia, posteriorly located arteriovenous malformation, radiculopial artery. This radiculopial artery vascularizes the shunt here. The shunt is glued and fills the whole nidus, cure of the lesion. The anterior spinal artery at that time in 2000 did not participate to the spinal cord vascular, abnormal vasculature. The lesion is exclusively located at the posterior aspect of the cord. 2010, the patient comes back and bleeds. Look at here at the vascular. So remember the spinal cord of 2000. This is now the spinal cord in 2010. The vasculature was absolutely normal in 2000. In 2010, he has built a de novo arteriovenous malformation that will further evolve over time and create even a false aneurysm uh, because of changes in the architecture and bleed. Another case, look here at this radiculopial artery vascularizing a nidus. Look please here at this curve. This is artery. This is vain. This is 2009. This is now 2013. The curve here, you have a vascular malformation on the root that has been created over time. So you cannot believe that these lesions are fixed lesions. The angiograms that you would see is just a snapshot at one moment of the vasculature, but then afterwards it evolves. As far as natural history is concerned, there are few uh, papers in the literature that deal with this natural history. If you make a meta-analysis of these large uh, series that have been published previously, you will see that around 50%, 40 to 69% of patients will undergo a neurological deterioration in a stepwise fashion with episodes of acute uh, episodes of hemorrhagic accident in about 50% of patients with rebleeds that might occur. And the progression of the symptoms will bring to a dependent severe neurological status in the time frame of about six years. There is a recent paper published by a Chinese group of a large number of patients uh, with a uh, rather interesting uh, observational period. You could see, or they could see, that about 56%, 65%, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, had an acute onset. And with also here risks annually of general deterioration proving again that we are dealing with severe neurological diseases and bad neurological outcomes. So if we speak now about embolization, as I told you initially, the embolization is based on three data. The anatomy, the anatomy of the lesion and the anatomy of the region in which the lesion is embedded because we perform this, this embolization without any provocative tests. We only rely on anatomy, patients being put always under general anesthesia. We have to deal with the architecture and we have to deal with the symptoms. Some rules, again, if the AVM is vascularized by the anterior spinal artery, people think it is always intramedullary, which is also obviously wrong because you have understood that you can very well have a lesion vascularized by the anterior spinal artery inside of the ventral sulcus, outside of the cord. So you will have them to go selectively with your microcatheter into each of these small sulcal artery, disconnect the sulcal artery, and finally obtain this kind of result, preserving the continuity of the anterior spinal artery. So the anterior spinal artery, if you have to embolize a lesion that is vascularized by it, you use the anterior spinal artery as a highway to reach finally the secondary or tertiary branches that will participate to the vascularization of the cord. As far as architecture of, is concerned, 
surprisingly, when we looked in Bicetre at that time, early 2000, uh, about the relationship between the architecture and the symptoms, we found surprisingly that there was no statistical significant difference between the rate of hemorrhages among patients with venous ectasias or without venous ectasias, with fistulae or without fistulae, or with aneurysms or without aneurysms. So the architecture is not everything. Of course, if you have a lesion with an aneurysm, we consider the aneurysm as a primary target because it represents a weakness, a fragility of the lesion. But the symptoms of the intradural spinal cord shunts are mostly related then by the, to the veins. And the veins have their importance on the onset of the symptoms, either by the progressive myelopathy that creates finally this uh, congestion of the cord or by direct compression of the cord by the venous ectasia. And you see how the cord is totally compressed by the huge venous ectasia here. Um, acute symptoms are mostly related to hemorrhages sometimes to venous thrombosis, but mostly hemorrhages. You have a high frequency of hemorrhages in the cervical location. But interestingly is to note, first, that recurrent hemorrhages in the experience we have is rather rare in a short time frame. Second, that spontaneous recovery occurs in more than 70% of patients who have bled in both pediatric and adult population. This is why we never try to embolize a lesion in the acute phase. We wait for the recovery of the patient and then we perform the embolization. Embolization is never performed with particles because there is a recanalization. We never use onyx because of the difficulties of penetration and the too deep penetration inside of the uh, uh, vasculature, abnormal vasculature. Uh, sometimes we use uh, coils. If you have an aneurysm, for example, as here, the aneurysm precluded the endovascular navigation and the distality of the branches of the anterior spinal artery. So I decided here to coil first the aneurysm and then go inside of the, of the uh, vasculature, you know, to reduce the shunt going from that aspect to that aspect and allowing the patient to dramatically improve. Another way how to use coils in this uh, dramatic uh, case of a patient, young patient with an HHT disease, huge compression of the cord, uh, anatomy recognized by the uh, angio MR, and angiography shows that you are dealing with a single hole macro fistula with a giant ectatic vein inside of the ventral sulcus, displacing the cord in totality. And both arteries coming from above and from below joined in a very small segment inside of the pouch. So there was no security to embolize properly this uh, uh, lesion with glue. So I decided here to coil the pouch transarterially to fill the pouch with the coils in order to obtain then secondarily the exclusion of the, uh, of the lesion itself. So if we speak about embolization, what should we expect from endovascular management of spinal cord arterial venous shunt? Of course, ideally you expect to cure the lesion. And cure can be obtained in some circumstances. This is again an example of a micro fistula this time, vascularized by an upper radiculomedullary and a lower radiculomedullary artery. You can then go with a microcatheter through the main vessel, hook inside of the sulcus, the sulcal artery vascularizing the shunt, deposit one drop of glue inside of the shunt, and obtain then cure of the shunt with respect of the anterior spinal artery. And uh, normalization of the clinical status of the patient. If you cannot obtain cure, you go for stabilization of the natural history, of stabilization of the symptoms, improve the symptoms, or allow uh, to stop progression of the symptoms. And this is then always based on this angioclinical semiology. Angioclinical semiology means which are the part of the malformation that is responsible for the symptom. And then you target on this 
specific part of the lesion, your embolization to allow the symptom to regress. Example here, I've already showed you this case of this young girl presenting with tetraparesis because of compression of the cord and pain. Uh, you see very well the veins that are absolutely bulging into the canal and compressing the cord. This is then one of these injection of glue inside of the sulcal artery, inside of the transmillary compartment, and this is the result that can then be obtained. Patient is absolutely normal, improves to totality, and she remains with a very small shunt located in the sulcus that is not touched for the timing and that we follow up. And of course, the, one of the main points is the le if the lesion has bled, you have to avoid hemorrhage and avoid the recurrence of hemorrhage. And this is also to play with the architecture. This is one of the significant examples. You have here an arteriovenous malformation that has bled. Look at the false aneurysm here at the upper part of this lesion. This is then the super selective uh, view uh, where you see very well which artery gives rise to the false aneurysm. So you will begin to embolize the part of the lesion that carries the false sac, which points to the bleeding point. And after having embolized selectively this picture, you have then this residue that can be later on embolized in better and safer condition and obtain cure of the lesion in these circumstances. So targeting step by step the uh, different compartments of uh, the vascular malformation, you obtain this, rec this absence of uh, recurrence of hemorrhage and protection of the patient. And here, once again, a nice example of how to play with anatomy, architecture, and the symptoms. This young boy obviously has bled hematomyelia inside of the cord. The vascular malformation architecture shows that the posterior spinal artery are rather small and bring some kind of to some kind of collateral network. The main network being taken in charge by the anterior spinal artery here. But this anterior spinal artery carries this bizarre aspect at that level. And if you go on the three-quarter view, you see very well on an oblique view that you are dealing here with continuity of the anterior spinal artery. Here is the continuity below. There you go into the sulcus. You cross through the sulcus and you reach the posterior surface of the cord. In other words, anatomically, you go from the anterior spinal, you go into the sulcus, you cross through the cord, you reach the posterior aspect, and then you can embolize it safely and disconnect the lesion in good conditions, just by playing with this anatomy. So some results to finish. Uh, I just show you the latest uh, uh, review that we had. Uh, we are going with Katsuhiro again to make the updated review of our results. Uh, this is based on 202 intradural spinal cord arrival shunts, 147 embolized with glue, 96 with the anterior, via the anterior spinal artery, always under general anesthesia <coughs> without any provocative tests. We obtained 100% of cure of the lesion in about 60% of cases. The majority of the cases being taken, uh, and, and uh, uh, 50 to 99% of cases, which brings to an overall rate of cure or mastering above the half of the lesion in about 75% of cases. This cure rate might sound unsatisfactory, but this has to be counterbalanced by the clinical results. And these clinical results, in our experience, show that nearly 92% of cases, you have patients normal, stabilized, or improved without any recurrent hemorrhage, with only 3.4% of per permanent significant morbidity, 2% of unchanged treatment, and 2% recurrent hemorrhage despite embolization, but in very specific, very specific cases due to highly angiogenic AVM uh, or uh, a patient that could not come back uh, from their uh, country, the treatment being not finished yet. This is one again, one example of this complication. The patient looks very nice. The results look very nice by this connection. But look here, this very small scar corresponding to a small perforating infarct that has created a neurological symptom. <laughs> 
very rapidly here. You can play with this anatomy. You can play with this expert CT. You know then exactly where you have to go to sacrifice this aneurysm to take them out and have then good results also here with this connection of this intramedullary vascular malformation and obtain satisfactory clinical result in this case. We skip that one. So why do we don't use onyx or uh, 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 very dense uh, uh, embolization. This is a case that I had years ago in Bicetre where I made a mistake, why I pushed too much glue inside of the nidus itself. The result looked eventually satisfactory, but the patient had indeed a brown sequet syndrome because my glue had penetrated too far inside of the nidus and has certainly contaminated then part of the intrinsic vasculature of the lesion. So we have to be very cautious in these circumstances. So danger of the wedge position and absolute danger of onyx. What do we do if you have multiple shunts? Of course, you have to diagnose and treat first the symptomatic lesion, and you will manage the secondary lesion according uh, to the same architectural rules. So you see very well that this lesion here has bled. This one carries the full stack. This has not carrying any full stack. You, you begin the embolization by disconnecting this lesion, and after having cured this lesion, you can eventually tackle the upper one. What do we do in HHT disease? There is a prevalence also uh, of uh, CNS arteriovenous shunts. Three to eight percent have spinal cord shunts. They are mostly located or considered to be macrofistulae. Uh, the problem is you have to manage them as any other lesion, but but you should not forget the lungs. You can cure the lesion. But if you get to check the lungs with the pulmonary fistulae, you will just continue to put your patient at risk for further neurological symptoms with abscesses or strokes. So this has to be controlled. So with, what can I say or propose you as conclusion? The, guideline, the guidelines that we have for management of symptomatic intradural spinal cord arteriovenation, if a patient presents with acute spinal cord symptoms, the first exam to perform is MRI. If MRI shows an hemorrhage, we go for MRA. There is no reason to do an angiogram at this stage because the rate of rebleed is very low, exceptional in the first weeks, and we will not embolize in emergency, waiting the patient to recover. So we wait for this recovery, except in some circumstances in the early pediatric population. And we try to do embolization then in first intention whenever possible. Example here, hemorrhage, angio-MR, stop here, angiogram when the patient has recovered. You see very well which are the architecture points with the nidus and the full sac. This can be disconnected in two steps later on. If the patient has with spinal cord symptoms acute, an MRI doesn't show an hemorrhage but shows thrombosis, we also do MRA. No need to do an angiogram. The patient is placed under anticoagulation in order to avoid the spread of the clot inside of the venous system. We wait also for recovery that will occur in the majority of cases thanks to the anticoagulation, and we embolize in first intention whenever possible. The question of corticosteroids remains also here debatable. And last but not least, if you have progressive symptoms, once again, MRI, MRA, the angiogram will then perform rapidly according to the onset of the symptom, and we try to embolize in first intention whenever possible. So you see you have different types of diseases, macrofistulae, microfistulae, small niduses, superficial intramedullary niduses. The main question that I still ask myself, are we dealing here with the same diseases? And do these or do have these diseases the same natural histories? And I was very surprised also when we checked with Katsuhiro the overall repetition of these spinal cord lesions according to the localization on the cord and on the what we call the histogenetic segmentation of the cord, which is a new concept. 
Anton Varavanis from Zurich and Luis Puelles from Murcia, Spain, have told us that histogenetic uh, um, segments, ex units, exist at the level of the brain. The same kind of histogenetic cementation exists at the level of the code. This means that the code is in fact made of five different histogenetic units that each carry their own biological features and genetical features. And you see very well that according to the type of the lesion, the distribution of the lesion inside of these, of these histogenetic lesions is different. So the possibility exists that because of these biological features, you might have different natural histories, you might have different uh, uh, outcomes in these circumstances. And this is certainly something new that we have to consider in the future to better understand these devastating conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for a brilliant talk. It is really a wonderful talk we have ever heard in spinal cord vascular malformations. Uh, can I ask you to off your screen, screen share, please, sir? Yeah. Wonderful lecture, wonderful lecture. So, Professor Choudhury, are you there? Do you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. So, shall we take the questions after your talk? Is that better? I think you... uh, we'll take the question after my talk. We'll talk, discuss afterwards. Yeah, thank you, sir. So, once again, uh, thank you, Professor uh, George Rhodes, for your brilliant talk. I think it is an eye opener for all of us. It's an extraordinary talk. So for that, uh, we'll move on to next talk. And the talk is by Professor uh, Jed A. Choudhury. And he will be talking on unlocking of the spinal cord disease. Just before moving on to his talk, I'll just give a brief introduction of Professor Choudhury. At present, he's a staff uh, neuroradiologist and ex-chairman of radiology and medical imaging in Edmondston Regional Hospital in New Brunswick. He's a clinical professor of radio, uh, diagnostic radiology at University of Starbrook, Quebec. After graduation from uh, Silet Medical College, Bangladesh, he uh, moved on to Paris for his training in, in neuroradiology. He was first led us to Kremlin Michet Hospital, Paris, under supervision of Professor Pierre. Legends and Professor Dominique Doyle. Following his residency and specialization from the University of Stars, uh, Sorbonne in Paris, he, uh, he did his fellowship in neuroradiology from the University of Pierre and, Pierre and Marie Curie in France, and fellowships in maxillofacially radiology and MRI from the University of Paris. He also did his additional training in from Karolinsk Institute, uh, Stockholm, Sweden, from University Hospital of Vienna. He did mini fellowship from John Hopkins and MRC University in the US. Then he traveled to Saudi Arabia for uh, his job and training for, the, for uh, young doctors over there. And he was in Bangladesh for a couple of years for uh, innovation of MRI in different uh, private and public sectors. And he's a very good friend of us. Whenever we seek any help from him, he's always there to help us. And he's doing, uh, he's doing with his tremendous effort to make this webinar happen for us. And we are very much grateful to him. And now uh, we'll be moving on to his lecture, and his title is Unlocking the Disease of Spinal Cord. So, Professor Choudhury, please, will you start your lecture? Uh, thank you very much. Can you please uh, allow me to share my screen?
do you see my uh, my slides yes of course okay good <clears throat> So, unlocking the diseases of the spinal cord. Hello everyone, good day. In today's webinar session, I'll be talking about the most commonly seen diseases involving the spinal cord in our daily practice. To be honest, we must agree that the clinical expression of the diseases of the spinal cord are often confusing and overlapping. Being a radiologist, some of us are uncomfortable to interpret the spinal MRI and even some of us dislike to report the MRI of the spinal cord. In the next 40 minutes, I'll walk you through the common spinal cord diseases. I'll try a semiological approach to reach a reasonable diagnosis in particular clinical context. I'll try to make my presentation as simple as possible. And after attending the presentation, both the radiologists as well as the clinicians will be more comfortable and confident while addressing the diseases involving the spinal cord. So let's move forward. The spinal cord is the tubular prolongation of the brain. It serves as a highway communication between the brain and the rest of the body. The embryology has been described by George Rudesh and let me recapitulate a little bit of embryotomy, very little. The notochord appears in the mesoderm by the end of third week of development and neural tube is formed at the end of fourth week. The spinal cord develops from caudal third of the neural tube. The average length of the spinal cord is about 45 centimeter. It weighs about 35 gram. It extends from middle oblongata till D12L1 level. The caudal extremity of the spinal cord is called conus medullaris. Same as brain, it also is covered by meninges. However, the subarachnoid space expands beyond the conus to form the dual sac. The gray matter in spinal cord is centrally located, just opposite to brain and is butterfly shape. The wings of the butterflies are called horns. The spinal nerves originate from the horns to form the peripheral nervous system. <coughs> there are two horns in each side. One is anterior and the other is posterior. Each nerve has one motor root arising from the anterior horn and one sensory root arising at the posterior horn. These roots unite together to form a single spinal nerve. The ventricular system also extends to the spinal cord through foramen majendi and is called central canal. It is lined by ependymal cells. The spinal cord is supplied by spinal arteries and spinal vein and has been extensively in detail described by George in the previous presentation. And in just, I'd like to mention that in cross section of the uh, spinal cord, the anterior two third is supplied by anterior spinal artery. Spinal cord has got three segments, cervical, dorsal, and lumbar. The cord is iso-intense in all sequences without any evidence of extended compression. Everywhere, the spinal cord is surrounded by T2 high signal of CSF. Vertically oriented spinal nerves travel beyond the conus and give the impression of tail of a horse. So it is called coda equina. In tethered cord, the corners extend beyond L2 level. The phylum is thickened and tethered. The dural cul-de-sac is slightly widened without any bony scalloping, as you can see here. At times, the tethered cord is accompanied by a fatty component extending beyond the spinal canal through the neural defect. It is called lipomyelocell. A near histological diagnosis can be achieved in MRI by application of suppression, fair suppression technique. Any defective closure of the neural tube may cause protrusion of the spinal cord or meninges at any level in any direction. When the meninges are herniated, it is called meningocell, and when it is accompanied by a small portion of the spinal cord, it is called meningomyosal. You can see one example of meningomyosal in the first image at the cervical level. In diastenotomyelia, there is splitting of the cord in separate canals. The hemicanals are separated by bony or fibrous, fibrous spar. The hemicords usually reunite at the caudal end. At times, it may be associated with spina bifida. 
Usually the patient have cosmetic complaints and high midline dorsal cutaneous deer tail sign is usually associated with diastomatomyelia. In diagnosing the spinal cord disease, it is crucial to determine the epicenter of the lesion. Once the epicenter is identified, the diagnostic spectrum can be significantly reduced based on area of origin. The lesion can be intramedullary, intrathecal extramedullary, or extrathecal. Intramedullary common lesions are neoplasm like ependymoma, astrocytoma, cavernoma, inflammatory lesions like multiple sclerosis, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, transverse myelitis, etc. And other intramedullary entities are syringomyelia as well as traumatic and vascular lesions. Intrathecal extramedullary lesions can be neoplastic like schwannoma and meningioma, inflammatory like Guillain-Barre syndrome. And it can be also extrathecal. The extrathecal lesions can be like discal pathology, Hirayama's disease and metastasis. When the epicenter of the lesion is conf confirmed in the spinal cord, it is, I mean, when the epicenter of the lesion is confined to the spinal cord, it is intramedullary. The diameter of the spinal cord may or may not expand. And when the epicenter is in the subarachnoid space, it is extramedullary intrathecal. A CSF cleft may be found around the lesion, as you can see in the second picture. The lesion is extrathecal when the epi epicenter of the lesion is outside the dural cell. In such case, no CSF cleft is identified. There may be an extensive compression on the dural sac. The vascular lesions have been extensively discussed by John, and due to time constraint, the other vascular lesions I'm not going to address in my presentation. This slide is showing three different examples of spinal cord lesion in axial plane along with schematic representation. The lesion in the first MRI is purely intramedullary. The second axial image is showing a lesion which is extensive medullary, there is extensive medullary compression, but still a peripheral CSF cleft is identified. So it is intrathecal extramedullary. The enhancing lesion is flattening the cord with posterior displacement. The third one is purely extrathecal, causing extrinsic thecal compression. This patient presented with gradual upper limb weakness over a period of months. A faintly enhancing lesion is seen in the cervical region. The lesion is heterogeneous, better seen in both axial and sagittal T2 images. It is a long segment intramedullary lesion and there is also enlargement of the spinal cord diameter. It is an intermediate signal both in T1 and T2, and both the upper and lower end of the lesion do not enhance, which suggests the tumor sittings rather than part of the mass itself. This lesion was an ependymoma on anatomical pathologic studies. This is another case of ependymoma showing hemosiderin capsize. It shows the well-defined intramedullary long segment lesion of the dorsal cord with expansion. There's heterogeneous enhancement and signal drop at both upper and lower ends in T2 due to hemosiderin from previous hemorrhage. About 35 to 40 percent of the spinal ependymomas are associated with capsi. However, it can also be seen in other types of tumors. So the presence of capsi is highly suggestive of ependymoma, but not Pathognomonia. This patient presented with backache and bowel brother dysfunction. It is a case of mixopapillary ependymoma arising from the corners. It is extending to phylum terminal and cauda equina. The sagittal images show a huge lobulated lesion with heterogeneous enhancement. The extensive scalloping and bony remodeling leading to widening of the canal. <coughs> Mixopapillary ependymoma is considered a WHO tumor of grade one and no malignant de degeneration has been reported. Ependymomas are the most common type of spinal cord tumor. They are usually expensile, leading to widening of the canal and involves a long segment. On imaging studies, they are heterogeneous 
and often and often enhances after get lenient. About 50% of the cases are associated with syringomyelia. Hemocytoin capsin is a good predictor, but not pathognomonia. This baby of nine months presented with torticollis, bilateral lower limb paralysis, and right-sided weakness. MRI shows an ill-defined intramedullary lesion with cord expansion. It is iso to low signal in T1 and high signal in T2 with a small distal cystic component. There is no hemorrhage. The lesion shows peripheral enhancement in XL images. It turned out to be a case of pilocytic astrocytoma. Pilocytic astrocytoma is again a WHO tumor of grade 1. This young patient presented with tetraparesis. There is long segment ill-defined intramedullary lesion with marked enlargement with cord diameter. It shows low signal in T1 and high signal in T2 with areas of faint patchy enhancement. It is better appreciated on XL slices and the XL images, the lesion is eccentric but not central and there is no hemorrhage or any bony scalloping. It is a case of a spinal astrocytoma. This patient also presented with progressive myelopathy developing over months and the case was proved to be a case of dorsal astrocytoma. MRI shows intramedullary extensile enhancing lesion having predominantly solid and tiny cystic component. The lesion appeared to be eccentric on XL images. No hemocytoin cap is identified and there is no bony remodeling. Astrocytomas constitute about 40% of the intramedullary tumor. They are more common in children and young adults. The lesions are usually extensile, infiltrative, and may involve a long segment. They may even involve the whole cord. The lesions are eccentric and peripherally located. The malignant potential is less than the astrocytomas involving the brain. Spinal astrocytomas are again a low-grade tumor. They may be classified as WHO tumor of grade 1 or grade 2. Histologically, there are four types of astrocytomas. Pilocytic, fibrillary, anaplastic and glioblastomas. And by order of the potential risk, they are considered from grade 1 to grade 4 WHO classification. Pilocytic astrocytomas are grade 1 and they are benign. Fibrillary astrocytomas are semi-benign or grade 2. Anaplastic type of, uh, uh, of astrocytomas are semi-malignant or grade 3, whereas the glioblastomas are malignant or grade 4. So the vast majority of the spinal cord tumors are astrocytomas and ependymomas. Now, is there any clue to differentiate these two lesions? With a reasonable analysis of a few factors, one may be able to predict one of those two lesions. First of all, astrocytomas are more common in children and ependymomas are more common in young adults. Ependymomas are more central as they originate from ependymal cells and astrocytomas are more peripheral. Though both astrocytoma and ependymoma enhances, the enhancement in ependymoma is well-defined, but the enhancement in astrocytoma are ill-defined. An association of syrinx and hemorrhage are more common in ependymomas, and ependymomas also call, cause bone remodeling. This patient presented with neck stiffness and tetraparesis. She's a cancer survivor with a history of breast cancer. A well-defined, short segment intramedullary lesion is seen at cervical level in T2. The lesion is solitary and centrally located. It shows intense homogeneous enhancement after gadolinium. There is marked disproportionate perifocal edema. Considering the clinical history, the solitary nature and short segment involvement, lesion was presumed to be case of metastasis. <clears throat> this patient presented with peristasis and progressive weakness of the limbs in a matter of months. A short segment intramedullary lesion is seen with hemocytoin capsin, an internal heterogeneous signal, especially in T2. In XL T2, the lesion appears as a pop cord and a clear peripheral hemocytoin ring in susceptible to weighted images. Compared to the previously described ependymoma with capsin, the lesion is only for short length and no appreciable enhancement. The perifocal edema is also scanty or practically nothing. These features are characteristics of cavernoma.
cavernomas are angiographically occult lesion. This is a known case of von Hippelander's disease. MRI shows multiple intense enhancing intermedullary lesions with a syrinx. The axial images reveal multiple flow, level, flow voids. In catheter angiography, the lesions are hypervascular, consistent with hemangioblastoma. Abdominal MRI shows a left renal mass at its inferior pole, consistent with renal cell carcinoma and multiple pancreatic cyst. Von Hippelander's disease is a phacomatous disease. The menomics of von Hippelander's disease, I call it HIPPEL, H-I-P-P-E-L. First H stands for hemangioblastoma. I stands for increased risk of renal cancer. First P is for few chromocytoma. The second P is for pancreatic lesion. E for endolymphatic sac tumor and eye trouble. And L stands for liver lesion. Uh, this slide is just a simple guide to reach a diagnosis while dealing with intramedullary tumors. In adult patients, one should first think of ependymoma, whereas in children, we should think of astrocytoma first. If the conus and coda equina is involved, we should think of mixopapillary ependymoma. In presence of flow void, we should think of vascular lesion like hemangioblastoma. Syringomyelia means intramedullary cavitation. It may involve a long or short segment. The syringe contain fluid and appear at high signal in T2. It is difficult to differentiate in MRI between hydromyelia and syringomyelia. The major complaints of syringomyelia are central cord or vein stem syndrome, dissociated sensory loss, and loss of pain and temperature depending on the area involved. Syringomyelias can be congenital, as in carry malformation, tumoral, traumatic, and idiopathic. This is the congenital syringomyelia. The sagittal image showing an elongated intramedullary fluid containing cavitation extending till the lower dorsal level. It appears as low signal in T1 and high signal in T2 with enlargement of the cord diameter. It is intramedullary. The axial images clearly identify the lesion is completely intermedullary and incidentally you can also see low-lying cerebellar tonsil in carry one malformation. This is a syringomyelia and in this case it is associated with an intensely enhancing tumor at brain stem. Also you can see another small enhancing lesion at the right cerebellum. This is an example of syringomyelia of tumoral origin. And in this case, this is a case of hemangioblastoma. This is an example of extensive post-traumatic syringomyelia from C2 to D11 level. This patient underwent surgery at upper dorsal spine, and we can see the bony defect at the posterior element of the vertebral body in the third and fourth image at upper dorsal level. While addressing the spinal cord pathologies, it is very important to emphasize on history, especially the mode of onset of symptoms. An abrupt symptom signifies ischemic changes. It takes days to weeks for transverse myelitis, neuromyelitis optic, and other systemic disease to develop, whereas it takes weeks to months for the tumors to develop. In order to analyze the myelopathy, we need to ask a few basic questions. First of all, Longitudinal extension. Does the lesion involve a short or long segment? Multiple sclerosis usually involves shorter segment that is less than the height of two vertebral bodies. The remaining demyelinating disease usually involve longer segment. The second of all, extension in horizontal or in transverse direction. The full thickness involvement usually occur in neuromyelitis optica and transverse myelitis, and the involvement is partial in multiple sclerosis, though occasionally complete involvement can occur in multiple sclerosis. And third of all, the location. High resolution T2 XL images are needed to assess the topographic distribution. If it is posterior, mostly those represent multiple sclerosis of B12 deficiency. And if it is anterior, usually it is ischemic. And in multiple sclerosis, the involvement can also be lateral and posterior. 
Next question is, is there any swelling of the cord? In transverse myelitis and tumor of the cord is usually, uh, the cord is swollen, whereas in multiple sclerosis and acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, there is practically no swelling at all. Enhancement is another very important factor to evaluate. It is especially true to differentiate between transverse myelitis and the tumor. Transverse myelitis usually do not enhance, whereas astrocytomas enhances. When the lesion enhances in transverse myelitis, it really becomes difficult to differentiate these two entities. Again, the mode of onset and clinical judgment plays a significant role in this case. Here in the first column, you can see the involvement of the whole cord in transverse plane. It can be either transverse myelitis or myelitis optica. In the second column, you can see the involvement of the anterior aspect of the cord, representing ischemic changes. The third column is showing the involvement of the posterior cord. It may represent multiple sclerosis when it involves a shorter segment and all subacute combined degeneration of spinal cord when it involves a longer segment. The fourth column is showing the lateral involvement in multiple sclerosis, but don't forget Multiple sclerosis can, can involve anywhere, whether anterior, posterior, lateral, or combination of all. Neuromyelitis optica is a no, also known as Davig disease. It preferentially affects the optic nerve and spinal cord, as the name indicates. It is a multiphasic autoimmune disease, but occasionally it can be monophasic. Neuromyelitis optica immunoglobulin G is a specific biomarker of Davig disease. Davig disease usually involves a long segment of the spinal cord or optic nerve and rarely can involve both at a time. There is swelling of the cord and optic nerve and the nerves may enhance. Demyelination of the spinal cord in neuromyelitis optica looks like transverse myelitis involving the full thickness diameter but differentiation becomes difficult from acute disseminated encephalomyelitis when it involves both spinal cord and optic nerve at a time. These are two different patients, the one in sagittal plane showing involvement of the spinal cord. <coughs> the axial image of another patient showing involvement of the optic nerve with enhancement. David disease use occasionally may involve the brain but lesions are very distinct from multiple sclerosis. They particularly involve the circumventriculary tissue. There can be pencil-like ependymal enhancement. Corpus callosums are sometimes involved and they may show a marble appearance predominantly a dysplanium. Acute disseminated encephalomyelitis is an acute monophasic inflammatory disease. It develops in a matter of days to weeks. It predominantly involves the children following vaccination. The symptoms include altered mental status, seizure, low-grade fever, and headache. Depending on the area of involvement, the clinical signs are multifocal and variable. Usually, basal ganglia and pons are involved in acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. The prognosis is excellent, and there is complete recovery occur in more than 90% of the cases within four to six weeks. This patient of acute disseminated encephalomyelitis showing a long segment swelling of the spinal cord with signal changes. Unlike multiple sclerosis, there is spontane involvement as well as the involvement of central gray matter. Almost complete recovery is seen on MRI performed at five weeks interval on follow-up MRI. There's only trace of signal changes in the spinal cord and almost completely normal pulse. Multiple sclerosis is a demyelinating disease of unknown origin. It is due to autoimmune response, possibly from activation of measles or herpes simplex virus. The disease is not contiguous, nor it is fatal. Pathologically, there is perivenular inflammation. The spinal cord involvement is seen in about 90% of the autopsy, and in 80% of the cases, it involved the spinal cord at the first attack. It may not be easily visualized in MRI. The average age of onset of multiple sclerosis is 30, rare in children and old age. The prognosis is variable and unpredictable, but 
One thing is sure, about 10% will be confined to the wheelchair in 15 years. These images show typical site of multiple sclerosis in brain and spinal cord. You can see the Dawson's finger radiating uh, in the first digital image, peritrigonal linear zone of high signal in the axial slice, and also you can see involvement of the root entry zone at infratentorial level. The sagittal image of the spinal cord is showing a short segment intramedullary focal T2 high signal without any core swelling. In the axial images, the spinal cord, you can see the lesion is involving the cord partially in the right posterolateral spot. Following repeated episodes, multiple sclerosis plaque may become confluent. Some of the plaques will enhance during exacerbation, suggesting active plaque. Occasionally, it may be difficult to differentiate between multiple sclerosis and edem. But please remember, multiple sclerosis is multiphasic disease, whereas acute disseminated encephalomyelitis is monophasic, so it is clinical. Multiple sclerosis involved young adults but acute disseminated encephalomyelitis usually involve young children. The gray matter is usually spared in multiple sclerosis, at, at least in early stage, but always involve the central gray matter in acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Concerning the pontine involvement, only root entry zones are involved in multiple sclerosis, whereas, whereas the entire pons is, in, is involved in acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Transverse myelitis is a disease of white matter or spinal cord. It is an autoimmune reaction following infection. Clinically, it appears as progressive motor, sensory, and autonomic dysfunction. The inflammation expands bilaterally, mostly in horizontal direction. A minimum of two thirds of the cross sectional area of the spinal cord is involved. There are two types of transverse myelitis partial and complete. The partial type is involving less than height of two adjacent vertebra, those carry more risk to develop multiple sclerosis in recurrent attack. And when it involves a long segment of the spinal cord, it is called longitudinal extensive transverse myelitis. About half of the cases are normal in MRI and may enhance occasionally. When it enhances, it may be difficult to differentiate from astrocytoma. Again, the mode of onset can help to differentiate. Transverse myelitis develop in a matter of weeks and astrocytoma develop in a matter of months. This secondary school uh, student presented with acute onset tetraparesis, rapidly ascending paralysis with neuromuscular weakness. It was clinically diagnosed as a case of transverse myelitis. MRI on admission was perfectly normal, but MRI performed after 11 days showing focal swelling with cord with T2 signal changes without any contrast enhancement. We can see the swelling of the cord in both sagittal and axial section. It is the case of acute partial transverse myelitis. In transverse myelitis, the involvement is bilateral, affecting more than two thirds of the cross section of the spinal cord in T2. This is also an adult onset transverse myelitis, but there is long segment T2 high signal changes of the spinal cord and subtle expansion of the diameter of this in sagittal slices. It involved more than two thirds of the circumference of the spinal cord, better seen on coronal and axial slices. There is no evidence of contrast enhancement. This is an example of complete type of transverse myelitis or longitudinal extensive transverse myelitis. The enhancement pattern in transverse myelitis is variable. At times there can be patchy enhancement of the lesion as in this case on longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. This gentleman presented with sudden onset anterior cord syndrome following thoracic endovascular aortic repair. If you look carefully, there is a long segment vertical pencil-like T2 high signal of the anterior cord. It also shows restricted diffusion. The axial images show typical owl's eye appearance. The owl's eye represent T2 high signal in the anterior horns. Unlike the previous cases just I showed, the onset of symptom in this case is subacute, that is within weeks. The long segment vertical pencil-like T2 high signal is not in the anterior aspect of spinal case in this case, rather it is in the posterior aspect. 
we can see inverted down sign on axillary majors. And this is a case of subacute combined degeneration of spinal cord due to B12 deficiency. This table gives us clue to identify the inflammatory spinal cord diseases. Mostly multiple sclerosis involve the short segment and usually there is no cord swelling. Both multiple sclerosis and acute disseminated encephalomyelitis involve the brain. Edema is usually bilateral right from the onset. In neuromyelitis optic and transverse myelitis, there is transverse involvement with spinal cord, at least two thirds of the circumference. Location wise, MS can involve anywhere, but usually it is partial, and ischemia usually involves the anterior part, whereas subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord involves the posterior part of the spinal cord. Also note, when there is involvement of both brain and spinal cord, the possibility of primary tumor is highly unlikely. And in that case, consider multiple sclerosis, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, and David disease and secondary metastasis. These are the few examples of traumatic myelopathy. In the first image, uh, the first image is the cord edema following the whiplash injury, you can see here. The second image and the third image are showing cord edema with hematomyelia. T1 intramedullary high signal represent methemoglobin. Also, you can see prevertebral soft tissue hematoma in T1 and the anterior teardrop fracture of C5. The fourth and the fifth images are showing complete cord transaction with intrasubstance gapping following the seat belt injury. And finally, the last image is showing extrinsic cord compression with marked cord edema and near complete translation of the spinal column. This patient presented with progressive weakness of limbs. MRI shows the homogeneously enhancing intrathecal but extramedullary lesion with dural tail entered to the spinal cord. Excel image reveals significant medullary compression leading to flattening of the cord and obliteration of the CSF space. The cord is displaced posteriorly and there is no extra canalar extension. This is a typical case of meningioma. This patient with similar complaint and has almost the same MRI findings, but the lesion is situated posterior to the spinal cord, causing severe extrinsic medullary compression in XL images, leading to flattening and anterior displacement of the cord. There is intense homogeneous contrast enhancement of the lesion following that, showing the dural tail. This is also a case of meningioma. This patient presented with parastasis and progressive left arm weakness. Again, we can see an intrathecal extramedullary lesion with extrinsic medullary compression. It is non-homogeneous and hyperintense in T2 and iso-intense to spinal cord in T1. These are, there is also intense linear contrast enhancement after gadolinium. Excel images reveal the enhancing lesion is protruding through the adjacent neural foramen to the left. The spinal cord is displaced to the right. This is a case of schwannoma. This is another case of schwannoma near phylum terminal. It is dumbbell-shaped enhancing lesion having both intra and extra canal component. The lesion is causing marked bony remodeling, better appreciated on sagittal images. In axial images, the lesion is protruding through the adjacent neural foramen. It extends posteriorly to the right kidney in retroperitoneum. You can see better in axial images. guillain barre syndrome is an acute demyelinating polyneuroradiculopathy. It is post-infectious or post-vaccinal autoimmune response to peripheral nervous system, and at times it can involve the cranial nerves. It is usually associated with Zika and West Nile virus. Classical clinical trials are asymmetric ascending paralysis, sorry, it is, it is symmetric ascending paralysis, sensory or autonomic dysfunction without an obvious sensory level, and hypo or areflexia. MRI may show thick and corda equina with enhancement. Conus enhancement can, can happen without any enlargement. Guillain-Barre syndrome is a neurological emergency. MRI is usually recommended to rule out other pathologies like transverse myelitis. Both sagittal and axial images in this patient 
of Guillain-Barre syndrome is showing thickened intrathecal spinal nerve with enhancement. There's possibly faint enhancement of the pyometer and conus without any enlargement. This 30 years old patient presented with gradual bilateral muscle wasting of forearm with sparing of the brachioradialis muscle. This was clinically diagnosed as a Hirayama's disease. MRI shows a short segment focal T2 high signal at C5, suggesting myelopathy and focal cord atrophy. No extensive cord compression in neutral position. Flexion MRI shows extensive cord compression from thick and soft tissue leading to anterior displacement of the cord. There's also enhancement of the perimedullary CSF. There is also effacement of the perimedullary CSF space at cervicodorsal level posteriorly. The cord appears bowstrung over the posterior step. Also, you can see the owl size sign in XL T2 due to chronic ischemic changes in the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord. The disproportionate growth between soft tissue and bony component of the spine can result ligamentous buckling and engorged venous plexus. It causes transient medullary compression in flexion extension of the spine. This explains the cause of muscular dystrophy and chronic ischemia in Hirayama's disease. Post-contrast images may show marked enhancement of the epidural venous plexus posterior. However, the contrast is not needed to diagnose Hirayama's disease. This is a typical example of disc herniation causing extensive medullary compression with myelopathy. There is midline posterior displacement of the, of the spinal cord on XL images. So what is the take home notes? The clinical expression of the diseases involved in the spinal cord are overlapping, but age and mode of onset can shorten the diagnostic spectrum while making a provisional diagnosis. In my personal opinion, it is not a bad idea to request MRI for both brain and spinal cord in one setting when we are lacking clinical points of factors to reach a provisional diagnosis. Again, the cost benefit factor and the potential outcome must be evaluated on a case to case basis. Guillain Barre syndrome is a disease of peripheral nervous system and it is a medical emergency. MRI is a powerful adjunct in diagnosis, prognosis, and to evaluate the treatment response. While analyzing MRI, it is important to determine the epicenter of the lesion and segmental distribution. Of course, emphasis on clinical history, particularly the mode of onset and the age of the patient can never be ignored. Choosing the appropriate protocol in MRI is the key to a diagnosis. So the detailed clinical information, again, with a provisional diagnosis is expected from the clinical colleagues. The role of radiologist is to choose the most appropriate protocol based on the information provided clinically. He must upgrade or downgrade or even dismiss the provisional diagnosis. His job is to help our clinical colleagues to proceed in the right direction in order to have the best quality of patient care. With this, I'd like to conclude and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Chowdhury, for your brilliant talk. Uh, really, today, both of the talks were excellent for us. It was a very good learning curve for us. So now, there must be too many questions from the audience. Uh, in the audience, we have, as a panelist, I told you, Professor Konok Kante Borua, sir, Honorable B.C. Wangamundu Sheikh Moody Medical University. We have Professor Kajidin Mohamad, sir, Director of Neuroscience Institute, National Neuro Institute of Neuroscience. We have Professor Yozam Bitkoreshi, sir. We have Professor Etienne Mosheri, sir. So, as a panelist, I would like to request Professor Kaji Din Mohammed sir, Professor Kaji Din Mohammed sir, to have a few words regarding today's webinar. Or do you have any questions, please? Professor Kaji Din Mohammed sir. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Shafiq Mohammadi Sat in wonderful webinar discussion on spinal cord. I must thank Professor 
Judge Rudick and Tonsa David Chudu for their Masai speech. So far, I have learned in my lifetime. This, in fact, is not, a, not only a Masai speech, but it's also a master class to the disease. And this is, in fact, a million dollars guided to the Islamic world. And I have so many mysteries, so many adventures, and so many excitement that we, I personally did know even in the past. I am very much thankful to all of the speakers for giving us a very wonderful view of this panel too, which I, I think clinically important, but many a times ignored. Many a times. We as a clinician, you know. The disease that is discussed by Professor George Rudy, which are extremely uh, in my mind, not practiced with clinical guidance, because in our practice, we think common thing commonly happens, rare thing rarely happens. So many a times we missed the rare causes of Hispanic disease. Actually, through a misrepresentation, we tend to do the rare thing sometimes to be diagnosed and sometimes could be managed nicely so that the patient can make a quality of life. This is very important. So rare thing usually rarely happen, but it does not always happen. It is not good. It happens. And might be that as our mind does not know, we miss many cases. Again, presentation professor did a surgery, as usual, his wonderful presentation covering all aspects of spinal diseases from medical treatment surgical to traumatology and very classical differentiation from one from the other. This is a very helping guide to the bedside when you see the patient and compare the new radiology with the clinical presentation. That actually gives a good guide to all of us as a clinician bedside. And, and, and finally, I thank both of the speakers for wonderful presentation. I thank Dr. Shafiq for organizing such a wonderful session and particularly for his I have learned a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, request Professor Anisul Haksar to have a uh, few words regarding today's webinar. Sir. Okay, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. I must uh, like to express my happiness to see Dr. Dimama's health with good health and happy. Next, uh, I would thank the organizers who are having this ongoing seminar, which is very useful for senior as well as the junior uh, neurosurgeons and neurologists as a whole. I just, I want to make um, one question and uh, some comments, like especially Dr. Kedai uh, um, Choudhury. It was nice to listen to him. Always it is nice. I just uh, wonder if he can one day talk about some uh, signs which are very, very interesting and very, very pinpointing signs to some neurological degenerative conditions like he mentioned today owl's eyes, then there are so many things, tiger's eye, hot crossband sign, ribbon sign, um, your um, hummingbird sign, and so many signs which are very, 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 very uh, correct mnemonic for a specific neurological degenerative condition. I'm just talking from my top of my mind. So this is another request when he makes any other lecture series, he mentions all these for the uh, uh, neurologist and research. Second is, a couple of years ago, this is to Professor uh, Rodesh, uh, George Rodesh, um, please try to help me. About seven, six, seven years ago, I saw one patient uh, referred from GP who had claudication, intermittent claudication, and finally he suspected uh, his letter was that could be a spinal canal stenosis or this. He had all the uh, 
conservative management, especially exercise, etc., physio. So when I saw him, uh, I'm not going to details. So when I saw him, he had everything normal, only intermittent claudication pain and numbness in the lower, uh, maybe left side more than the right. And uh, no bladder problem, no weakness, no persistent weakness. It has been going on for around six months or so. So only abnormality I found was a bit of brisk reflex in the lower limbs without any uh, heart sign. So I advised that MRI. The neuroradiologist did it, and then they phoned me to send, they sent the patient to them because they found something suspicious of uh, herpigenous sign, and they thought they need a contrast, I mean, contrast MRI or NGO. So ultimately, it was diagnosed, and we presented it in our clinical meeting, in the radiology meeting, and it was diagnosed as Foma Ella Joannine a couple of years ago. So just one question. Foma Ella Joannine, how common it is? And uh, he did not have much destruction of the cord, but just started edema, and he had congestion of the venous, um, what is it called? The venous uh, mesh around the cord. So it was very initial, and they have found finally one AV fistula, and they, they, they are interventionist, very young, to neuroradiologist, and they just thrombosed it, and, and, and he was passively saved. So how common are these? Do you still get these very often? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, Thank you very much. You hear me? Yes, sir. You can hear okay. you. Thank you, yeah, very yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, we rarely see Foyer-Lajoinine syndrome nowadays because they represent, in our experience at least, the uh, very ultimate step of the spontaneous evolution of dural fistulae. Uh, when uh, they, uh, these venous congestion and venous myelopathy has occurred for many months or years with spinal cord atrophy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, usually nowadays, thanks to MRI also, the diagnosis is made more, so we don't see these overstepped situations anymore. I think I've seen one only in my life uh, uh, of these uh, very long-lasting situations coming from a country far away from us and uh, where the diagnosis was not made properly because of no access to MR. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. It thank was in, uh, in NHS I was working at the time. And so it is about seven, eight years thank ago. You, so, um, I also had just seen one. And so this is MRI, which is preventing it, is it? That's good. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'd like, uh, I'd like to request Professor A.T.M. Mosharif Hussain, sir. Uh, he is president of Bangladesh Society of Neurosurgeons to have a few words on today's webinar. Professor A.T.M. Mosharif Hussain, sir. Thank you, Dr. Shofik. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here uh, to uh, this uh, session August uh, webinar and the two speakers particularly George Rodesh, uh, the simply brilliant and uh, such a, an elaborating and illustrative lecture, uh, particularly this sort of uh, uh, relatively the forbidden or unknown areas for most of, the, most of us, particularly uh, the way he shows the, uh, particularly the uh, vasculature and the other uh, uh, angiograph of the the spinal cord is simply brilliant. And uh, see, he particularly the intervention, the super selective embolization, the usually this is a master class work. And uh, we have uh, learned a lot from his uh, illustrative lecture. And uh, I think it's a great opportunity for all of us to hear from uh, him. And uh, I must thanks also to Jet Choudhury, we frequently uh, listen from him. And every time we uh, listen from him, his uh, lecture is always uh, simply amazing and always we enjoyed uh, very much. And uh, I think the 
particularly with the neurosurgeons and the neurologists uh, benefited a lot from these two uh, lectures. And I must thank the organizer, particularly on behalf of that, the uh, neurosurgery department, Dhaka uh, Medical College, uh, they organized such a uh, beautiful webinar uh, on the particularly the spinal cord pathology. Again, I thank everybody for participating in this uh, sort of webinar and also on uh, behalf of Bangladesh Society of Neurosurgeons, must thank the organizers. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Professor Varish, can I ask you a question? <coughs> Sir, you know, spinal cord disease, vascular disease classification is very difficult. There are many ways to classify it. But I understood from your lecture regarding uh, NIDAS type of malformation classification. But you mentioned in your lecture what I understood. The extramedullary, how can we correlate with this with uh, what we know, perimedullary multi-hole fistulas. Can you please explain us? Extramedullary classification in your latest publication. Hello? Sir, sorry to interrupt, sir. Probably, sir, Rodester is temporarily disconnected. We can see him. Okay. In that case, let's move on to our next panelist. Can I request Professor Firoz Ahmed Qureshi, sir, to have his words on today's webinar? Sir. Yeah, audible? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thanks all. Very glad to see all the dignitaries here. Very much. The two speakers have covered and unrevealed the mysteries of the spinal cord. George Rhodes. He is unique to his speech. He has unrevealed the spinal AVM very finely and keenly and left no stone untouched. The comparison of him is only him, nothing else. Professor J.D. Chaudhary, we know him from very well. And he has a brilliant speech, and always he is brilliant on his speech, making the harder things very easier. And he has covered the both neurosurgical aspect and medical aspect, the neurological aspect of spinal cord disease, and sometimes overlapping to that of the brain. So thank you, thanks both of the speakers. And also I thank the audiences, the presence of which has made this webinar very successful one. From the, from, on behalf of the Society of the Neurologists of Bangladesh, Society of the Neurosurgeons of Bangladesh, and also the Society of the Neuroradiologists of Bangladesh, we, I thank all the participants and especially the speakers to accommodate so much uh, audiences in this webinar. Thank, thank all, thank you very much. Now, I'd like to request uh, Brigadier General Syed Jahirul Alom. He's Head Diagnostic and Interventional Radiology Combined Military Hospital, Dhaka. To say a few words, please, regarding today's webinar. Brigadier General Syed Jahirul Alom. Are you there? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shafiq, for inviting me in a, such a, uh, I mean, uh, crucial and so nice uh, webinar and simply uh, one one word uh, is outstanding outstanding i mean uh, no word is enough to define these two lecture especially uh, uh, professor rodesh he is out of uh, i mean he's not connected so i would have asked him how he collected or how he has taken the spinal images spinal different types of vascular malformations in spine because we have tried in our cath lab so many times to take the different types of spinal uh, uh, images nicely but hardly we could satisfy ourselves so it is my great question to him how he could do it and um, the image quality excellent excellent so uh, really it, no no word is enough to uh, define the quality of his speech and we have learned a lot of things and regarding uh, z uh, choudhury sir he is uh, everyone has said regarding his speech and he has uh, very nicely he has covered all the important issues of spinal cord uh, many a times we have come across this uh, i mean uh, these uh, 
common features and common uh, findings in MRI, and he has very nicely uh, covered it. And uh, really, we are very happy and we are very benefited out of it. Our residents, they are uh, enjoying it. We are participating. And thanks to Dr. Shafiq and uh, his team for arranging consecutive uh, excellent webinars. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Professor Rudesh, I have a question to you. Can I? Hello. Can I proceed? We cannot hear you, sir. You hear me? Yeah. Hello. What I understood from your classification regarding nidal type of malformations, the one of your variety was extra medullary. And from our uh, learning, we uh, know there is perimedullary multihole fissure also. Uh, can you correlate this too? Can you repeat the question, please? In your classification, what I understood, uh, the one of the uh, nidal type of variety was extra medullary. Yes. So we know from our past uh, learning that there, there is perimedullary fistula. It can yes. be single hole or multi hole. Yes. Uh, just I want to make it clear. How can you correlate this perimedullary fistula with your extra medullary malformations? The, uh, you, you, the, the treatment of perimedullary fistula in our practice is always with glue. Uh, exception made if you have an, uh, a particular anatomic disposition where you have normal territories close to the fistula that you want to preserve. Then I could eventually, as I've showed you in these large fistula in the sulcus, etc., then I use coils indeed, but this is exceptionally rare. Most of the cases, if not all of the cases, are done with glue in our practice. And there is there is a question in the chat box. You, can you give us some tips and tricks regarding how can we proceed with uh, glue? I mean, the ratio of glue. How do you choose? Um, it is simple. Well, I cannot say simple, but the rule is if you have a macro fistula, one of the very high flow lesions that end up into a giant venous pouch. The flow there is so high that you have to use what we call pure glue. Pure glue is in fact two cc's of glue mixed with 0.2 cc of lipiodol and 0.5 gram of, of tantalum powder to opacify properly the glue. If you don't add the powder, you, there is not enough lipiodol to opacify it. So this is for high flow fistulae, only for this high flow fistulae. For all the rests, the dilution of glue will depend on several things. The position of the catheter, the flow, of course, the aspect of the vessel, the tortuosity of the vessel, the way you inject the glue. I, can, I have no recipe to recommend. But what I can tell you is that most often now, I use more diluted glue than I used to use before because the flow conditions are different in the brain and in the cord. And if you want to reach a better outcome anatomically, more diluted glue, which is above 50%, is necessary. Of course, in these circumstances, you might have some escape of glue inside of the vein, which is, in my experience, of no real consequence, as long as you place the patient under anticoagulation for a few days after the procedure. Thank you, sir. More and more, I, I nearly never use anticoagulation for brain AVMs. I more often use now anticoagulation for spinal cord at your venous shunts because I fear the venous thrombosis that might eventually worsen the clinical situation. I have had patients at the beginning of my experience that have been totally cured from fistulae and who have worsened within 24, 48 hours because of some venous sludge phenomena and that have absolutely reversed under anticoagulation. So in order to prevent this, I prefer to give anticoagulation before than after. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, sir. Thank you to you. Thank you. Uh, we almost passed two hours and 15 minutes. It's a long webinar. We learned a lot. And that was a, a wonderful session, I would say. Dr. Borwa, his comment, please. Dr. Borwa, he yeah, is... I, I'll move on to his, yeah. So uh, now we are almost at the end. Professor Borwa, sir, Konakante Borwa, sir, is Honorable VC of Bangabandha Technology Medical University. He is our mentor. Actually, he is our guardian. He is guardian. He had too many appointments today, even then he could manage time to join us. So I'd like to request Professor Konakanti Borwa sir to uh, say a few words on today's webinar. At the same time, I'd like to request sir to conclude today's session also. Sir, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shafiq, for inviting me. And it is my honor to be present in this August uh, webinar seminar. I, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, Professor George Rodesh and Professor Chaudhary for their brilliant uh, lecture. First of all, the, uh, and uh, at the same time, I want to uh, wish our uh, thanks to the panelists and the, and the uh, participants. A very, very good evening to you all. First of all, I want to say that the presentation of Professor George Rodesh was wonderful. And he has narrated the uh, embryological basis of vasculature of spinal cord at the same time, uh, the development of AVM in the spinal cord. And he also wonderfully narrated the uh, treatment of this uh, uh, AVM in spinal cord. Um, I have a one question. You have said that one patient has deteriorated uh, when you have used uh, uh, excess amount of uh, glue. But how many patients have deteriorated uh, during your treatment? And uh, that is my one question that to know from you. Hey, the, uh, thank you very much for your question again. Um, the uh, amount of patients who have permanently worsened after endovascular procedure in our practice is 3.4%. Some patients worsen, of course, I have not counted them, but they have worsened transitorily. Why do they worsen transitorily? Because the glue that you inject is a liquid that will become solid. During polymerization, during the solidification, there is a heating effect, a thrombotic effect, and an inflammatory effect of the glue. And this on this very eloquent spinal cord tissue, because of this heating and inflammatory effect, might change a little bit the, the influx, the nervous fluxes in the, in the cord. And this might create an, uh, a problem. The, the, the way to stabilize or to improve this is to give the patient corticosteroids and anticoagulation eventually. And this helps then after a few days to recover uh, rather nicely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I must express my gratitude to you for a wonderful uh, presentation. And at the same time, uh, I was overwhelmed at your presentation, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I am also, uh, I am also uh, uh, congratulate, uh, congratulating uh, Professor Jadis Choudhury for his wonderful presentation. All the pathological aspect of spinal cord he has narrated and uh, MRI findings at the same time, their treatment and uh, uh, also aspect. Uh, I am very much overwhelmed his, uh, at his presentation. As, as usual, he is always with us and uh, helping us in many ways. I am very much grateful to both of the presenters and I have learned many things from their presentations. And at the same time, I want to congratulate the uh, neurosurgery department of Dhaka Medical College as well, Professor Rashid and Prof. Dr. Shafiq for organizing this wonderful uh, webinar seminar. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And I am concluding the session. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Thank Professor, you. for joining us. Thank you very Thank much. You.
Thank you very much, George. Thank you very much. You are so kind. It was a great pleasure and a great honor for me. I wish you all the best. Take care of Thank yourself you. very much. Hope, hope to see you in next seminars. I hope to. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Take care, all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Jodri, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. A special Thank thanks you, to Dr. Anis, Dr. Uh, Professor Dean Mohammed, uh, Dr. Kanokanti Borua, and all the senior staff, as well as the junior staff. Thanks. Thank you very Thank much you. for your patient, Dr. Firoz Ahmed Qureshi, and all the senior staff. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank Take you, care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Sir, in Kuradi, was sir? Thank you everyone for joining with us. Hope to see you in the next meeting. Allah Hafiz, good night. Thank you, thank you.